Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, undercover members of the press and uh, the constabulary. Um, I'm delighted you could stay this long to listen to me, particularly after the last session, which was uh, very interesting. I'm David Caldicott, and um, I'm a, actually a full-time emergency doctor. Um, I research illicit drugs and therapeutic drugs, mostly for shits and giggles in my own time. And um, I'm, in many ways, in the eyes of my colleagues, um, in the belly of the beast at the moment, um, where I actually run the risk tremendously of being tainted by your crazy ways, um, by the plants that you're growing in your, your devil's garden, um, by weird orgies and wild parties. I've had to reassure my, my wife that I haven't participated in any weird orgies or wild parties since I've arrived. Um, but that, that is embracing my poor children that um, affects both sexes equally, um, and that brings them together under mob rule, and um, that actually assassinates youth. Um, this is largely the perception um, of many of my colleagues in the medical profession. The, unfortunately, these sort of dime novels from the 1950s and 60s are still very much the way that my profession thinks about cannabis. Those of you who are Canaanites or worshippers of the uh, the, de the god Moloch will know that you can actually sacrifice your youth to marijuana. I, I have to emphasize the fact that I'm also um, a researcher with regard to the harms associated uh, with cannabis. Th there are harms associated with cannabis, and I know that that might not be a popular opinion uh, with listeners here, um, but it's usually to do with a, a lack of restraint and overindulgence and use by people who probably shouldn't use this product. Um, but I think it also adds to my credibility when talking to politicians about the utility of this as a drug. I'm not a, an advocate or a, a, a hemp embassy member just looking for widespread consumption. I'm looking for a restrained approach for a therapeutic product that has almost uh, irrefutable evidence of benefit. So I, I thought I would talk to you a little bit about, you know, this, this idea of a story that we're in at the moment, and all of us in this room are participating in this story. Um, it's got heroes and villains in it. It's a very old plot. It's the small person against the edifice. There will be consequences as to the outcome of this story, and history is going to be our judge uh, within this story. How we behave and the results of this story are, will become a matter of history. And so it's very important that we examine how we conduct ourselves within this story. I have, as I say, three kids under the age of five. And um, I think it's very important that the way we deliver this message, those of you who have children may have seen this movie, um, the new version of Cinderella. And I think it's very important when we're arguing with our opponents about therapeutic cannabis that we don't become rabid about it because it persuades no one. I think it's very important that as we argue about this issue that we have courage in the strength of our convictions and we are kind about the ignorance of our opponents and that we gently re-educate them. There are exceptions to this and I'll tell you okay. who we can go to town on. So I'm not going to tell you anything about the cannabis plant because you could probably tell me a great deal more about it than I already know. I'm not going to tell you about any of the constituents because you guys already know all about that. I am going to tell you that there's an Irish connection, um, that one of the first people, one of the first medicos, so one of the first of my type um, who looked at uh, medical cannabis was an Irishman, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy. And in fact, I understand that one of the great journals of cannabis in the world is actually now O'Shaughnessy's. He was an Irish man working in India from Limerick, and he was really something of a genius. He's one of the first few people to use intravenous fluids for uh, cholera. But he didn't limit his actions uh, to, to medicine. He also helped design the telegraph system in India as well. And he was the first person to systematically report the benefits of cannabis associated uh, with uh, uh, treating disease uh, out of India, which was really quite extent then. And rumor has it, although I've not been able to find any um, uh, definitive evidence, that he actually treated Queen Victoria's dysmenorrhea, or period pain, uh, with cannabis at the time. Here's another Irish connection, William Irish. I, I, I collect these, so I apologize. Um, and perhaps the, the era which 
cannabis became a thing. Cannabis became important, uh, or the first divisions between uh, cultural cannabis use and medical cannabis use occurred in the early 20th century um, in North America, um, where migrant workers uh, came to North America as a land of opportunity and brought with them their tipple of choice, um, which was, in, in fact, cannabis. And uh, you may be familiar with the tune of La Cucaracha, um, which, um, in fact, is a cockroach. Um, the original, obviously, is far more poetic than the translation. Um, but the Mexicans were the first, probably, ethnic group in the modern era to be persecuted uh, for their choice of drug consumption. And, in fact, it was this persecution that drove the banning of cannabis um, in the first sort of phases of the 20th century. Um, and interestingly, at the time, the American Medical Association was incredibly against this. Um, they argued very much that it was going to um, really impair um, not only the physicians, but the pharmacists and everybody who was prescribing cannabis at the time. I think the first point that we need to make to our colleagues who have problems with this issue is that medical cannabis is not recreational cannabis. I accept everyone's argument at the moment that you can have your, your joint in the morning and not be able to differentiate it between your joint in the afternoon. And that, in fact, is philosophically and intellectually correct. But this is not going to win our argument. And our argument needs to be won. Um, in fact, the, so, the way and the product that we're talking about is quite different to the, the product that we are talking about for those of you who enjoy it recreationally. I think to confound the two will actually blow up the entire debate um, among yourselves. There are people, and I know that Richard Di Natale, um, a good friend and collaborator of mine, has had mail from people who are angry about the fact that we are separating the two. But if this is ever to become a reality, those two have to be separated within Australia. I, I'm not sure what will happen in the future with everything else, but you cannot sail this boat into the sea of recreational cannabis use without passing through the stra straits of medicinal use. The effects of interdiction are quite clear on the, uh, well, on any drug that you care to look at, um, that they've greatly increased the the concentration of THC in cannabis, because that makes sense. That makes sense from a market perspective. If you are moving product around a country, you want to move a, a more purified form. It makes economic sense uh, to move from coca leaf to cocaine, to move from a low-grade marijuana to a high-grade marijuana, to move from opium to heroin. Uh, those are the, the sort of pressures of the market. And so the cannabis that was consumed some time ago, for which there's a good historical record, is quite different to the cannabis of the late uh, 20th century. So I thought I would present this initially as a primer on some of the mythologies that are associated. These are arguments that are used against um, uh, medical cannabis or therapeutic cannabis, and they arise from about 18 months of fairly intense interaction with federal politicians in Australia. Um, with academics in Australia, and also my good friends in the Australian Medical Association. Um, and these have largely been a series of, of red herrings and, and straw men designed to delay the implementation of therapeutic cannabis. Um, they mostly have no intellectual value and are easily refutable. So maybe you, if you don't know some of these things, you can add them to your toolkit, because it's very important everybody represents when it comes to talking about this, and that you represent in a way that appears calm and kind and informed. And merely turning around to people and saying, well, you're a fucking idiot and you don't know what you're talking about, doesn't win arguments. It merely makes people dig their heels in more. So the first argument, and it's a strong argument, um, is that there's no credible medical or scientific evidence that uh, medicinal cannabis is effective in treating medical conditions. And in fact, if that's true, we're done. The talk is over. I can sit down and make some, something to drink. Um, and there's also people say that the jury is still out and that trials and other research is not conclusive. Well, this is from the actual article that uh, the AMA uses in its own document arguing against medical cannabis. And if they had bothered to sit down and read the article, they would have actually looked and seen that the, the wealth of information in the article that they cite actually supports the use of medical cannabis. This is a type of an article called a meta-analysis. So it's a breakdown 
or it's a, I should say, not a breakdown, but an aggregation of numerous articles to look at what the sum total of knowledge shows. And if you look at the various ticks for these conditions, you can see that the body of published literature is greatly in favor of the, the utility of uh, medicinal cannabis. So to suggest that there's no evidence there at all, it's, it's actually a crock. Um, so why if some people think that we don't have a great deal of compelling evidence? And I need to, to, to thank the WODAC for this, um, this citation. Um, you know, the reason why we don't have this compelling evidence that um, you know, might convert other people's ideas is that because it's been blocked. Um, and people like the National Institute of uh, uh, Drug Abuse in the United States has not supported or funded any of this research that could have proved that uh, medicinal cannabis would be of utility. Um, and, and so there is a an un, very uneven playing field. And to say that there's no evidence is merely to say that we've not been allowed to ga gather any of that evidence. I think, I think there is a role for clinical trials. But clinical trials to give us more information about what conditions might be useful, um, about um, how to use it. There's absolutely no requirement whatsoever for clinical trials, for example, for compassionate use. And that includes palliative care or intractable seizures. There's no requirement for a trial for those entities at the moment. Um, and there's no medical uh, evidence required to introduce that sort of uh, uh, ther therapy immediately. The business of, of uh, creating this framework, which I think uh, Mr. De Natale is, is behind, um, is absolutely crucial for us to be able to conduct the trials which then will add to the body of evidence. So the trials are important, but they are not the sine qua non of whether or not we're going to conduct um, therapy with cannabis. I love this one, this is one of my favorites, that cannabis is a gateway drug. Um, and that there is such a thing as a slippery slope argument. Um, the, the, the idea, you might be familiar, all of you as cannabis consumers have probably drifted into injecting heroin because that's what happens to you all. Um, that's the general idea of the gateway theory, is that anybody who consumes cannabis will automatically and irrevocably descend into the darker depths of parental drug use. Um, that's largely been disproved. No, nobody really believes that anymore, apart from potentially some politicians. Um, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, even the Canadians who are getting a little bit politically conservative than, um, than they have been, do not really believe in a gateway theory anymore. And I guess the argument or the counter argument to that is that if you were to in introduce a tightly regulated cannabis market, by any means of measurement, there is uh, it currently underway in Australia, Everyone in Australia says that cannabis is very easy to obtain. There is no way that introducing an even more, uh, more tightly scrutinized and regulated market will make it even easier because it's already incredibly easy to score anyway. This, is, this, gets, this infuriates me, the idea that pot, legalizing pot sends the wrong message. So this is a... a um, well, it's, 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 it's the language of failed politics, of failed argument. Um, and it's been used to defend drug policies all around the world for generations. And it, the, it doesn't give us any information about consumption, and it doesn't tell us uh, anything at all. It is a, a debating tool. Here, here are some interesting messages from different countries around the world. There, there are those in Australia who believe, for example, that Sweden sends the right message by banning everything for everyone always, and that Holland is, well, it's in fact like the posters that I showed you to start with. It's the work, it's the devil's playground. So in Sweden, there's no doubt that fewer people are using drugs, but more people are being killed by drugs, and there's more bloodborne virus. Whereas in Holland, of course, more people are using drugs. That's a matter of common knowledge. And fewer people are being killed by drugs, and there's fewer hepatitic illnesses. So when people talk about what message they want to bring, what message they want to change, they need to be very careful what they mean. Sending the wrong message um, about medical cannabis is quite different to me. To me, you know, the message of banning uh, therapeutic cannabis is that is patients should not avail of a treatment that reduces their suffering in the last months of their life or for a chronic condition which nothing else is working. That's the message that we give not just 
our population, but the rest of the world, when we say that we think therapeutic cannabis is sending the wrong message. And I think that's a very dangerous message in terms of representing yourself in a global arena. Um, it's, pe people look at Australia, they look at the way people treat refugees here, they look at your drugs policy, and they judge your country. And you need to be careful about what people will judge about your country when you th say that young people shouldn't use cannabis to, s to stop their congenital epilepsy conditions. That's a dangerous way to portray Australia internationally. So, and, and of course, this is not a position that is shared by the vast majority of Australians. So, you know, we know for a fact from polling that the vast majority of Australians believe that medical cannabis is, and, and endorsement of medical cannabis is the right message. And I congratulate the Greens for actually taking a position on this, um, which is in line with the popular opinion rather than what they think might or might not get them elected. The idea that cannabis has dangerous side effects is probably true. I know that I would get some refutation from people in the audience, but there are, unfortunately, are, uh, case reports and case series of people being harmed by cannabis. And it's not unique in that way. It's like anything at all. I have a thousand different ways of killing you all. Uh, I would never do it in front of the cameras, but God forbid any of you heckle me too much, I'll find out where you are this evening and I'll kill you in one or two ways that can never be traced. Using products that are regularly available. Whatever I want, whatever, water, I could use to kill you. Um, oxygen, I could use to kill you. So cannabis is not u unique in the, the idea that it could cause harm. Everything, both licit and illicit, can cause harm. And once again, I would very politely suggest that the hardcore toking of 48 hours use in a stoner camp somewhere is quite different to the tincture uh, use of somebody who is um, consuming for medicinal uh, purposes. And, and so this is once again a deliberate confounding of the entity of medicinal cannabis and uh, recreational cannabis. This is... I, I, as you probably gather, a bit, a bit of a nerd, and I love toxicologists, and this is one of the first. This is a guy called Philippus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. Um, and obviously teased as a child, he abbreviated it to Paracelsus. And he's the guy who first said, um, uh, the dose makes the poison. And it's exactly the same with cannabis, is that it is not the nature of the plant itself that's dangerous, it's how it's used and what dose is used. Um, another argument is that cannabis can be addictive, and that's actually true. Um, once again, I'm sorry to disabuse you, but there is a cannabis withdrawal syndrome, um, and it's certainly, um, depending on how you use it, it can be more or less addict addictive. It is several orders of magnitude less addictive than many of the alternatives that we use currently, say, for pain relief. The, the charge has been made to us um, as supporters of therapeutic cannabis, that this issue has not been addressed by the pro-medicinal uh, cannabis lobby. I would quite simply turn around and say that the fact that it's much safer than opiates has not been addressed by the anti-medicinal cannabis lobby. There are lots of other painkillers that can be used, um, and they work, and our patients love them. They just love them. Seriously, they love them. And as medicinal folk, we love prescribing them. And we prescribe them by the bucket load. This is from the Medical Journal of Australia looking at prescribing patterns uh, for these uh, synthetic opioid medications. I'm sorry about the projections. I'm getting a little cut off here. But we, th this shows also the, the, the rate of deaths from synthetic uh, opiates, um, which is soaring not only in uh, the United States, but also in Australia. Um, so what... what we're looking at here is potentially an alternative that may have a public health impact. And, and I'll show you some data about that shortly. Another argument is that um, there, are, there are extracts that we could be using. Um, there's only one commercially available in, in Australia at the moment, the Satavix, which is, in fact, it's actually e extracted uh, from uh, the, the plant itself. It's a one-to-one -one THC to CBD ratio. In the, in the morning literature, it does say, like the little insert in the pack, that this, is, this could get you high. And it's only for one indication. So, um, so only one medical condition is licensed for its use currently. And it is mind-bogglingly 
expensive and well beyond uh, the resources that anyone, including myself, um, in this room have to, to use and, and give to my children. Were they ha did they have a condition that it required? And in fact, you can't see the reference there. I'm delighted for, to send this uh, um, uh, talk to anybody who wants the references. But um, the King's College um, uh, Economics Institute in the United Kingdom did an economic analysis of this drug and said it actually isn't worth prescribing. The, it, it works, but the cost is so prohibitive it should not be available on the National Health Service. Um, you know, the, we're getting into small um, potatoes here. People might argue that, in fact, there are, it's, it's, it's a Trojan horse for smoking. Um, in fact, as we've seen, there are all sorts of entertaining ways of consuming cannabis. Delicious cookies, uh, vaporizing, uh, tinctures. And there are new things on the market which you may or may not be familiar with. I think this is going to be very popular very soon. Um, the use of uh, vaporizing or these e-vape uh, cigarettes. And this is fascinating. This is being developed out of Israel currently. Um, this is a, th a thermal metered dose inhaler using crude cannabis to give you a specific dose um, in the same way as your salbutamol inhaler. Uh, gives you a, a, a dose. So the argument that you can't control dose is ludicrous. Um, one of the things I'm frequently charged with is that doctors oppose m medicinal cannabis. And when I'm told that, I sort of cock my head to the side and say, well, I am a doctor, actually. Uh, and that, you know, the Canadians don't like it or the Australians don't like it. In fact, as a, as a body of people, doctors are pretty conservative. I don't know if any of you had the misfortune to socialize with any doctors or go out for dinner with any doctors. Terribly dull people, uh, terribly unimaginative, not people you want to be out and about with. Um, and to suggest that all doctors oppose X, Y, or Z is like, say, for example, suggesting that all politicians believe in global warming. Uh, it's just nonsense, isn't it? For example, this is something that I was involved in um, only last year, um, uh, late last year, which was the ACT's um, clinical senate. So a, a discussion on what would our academic position be um, in the out of. So this is a body of all of the medical practitioners uh, who are affiliated to the medical school. What would our position be on medicinal cannabis? And I draw your attention to the first element there, um, that a preferred model is uh, one similar to the Dutch system of government-controlled supply with prescription access. Now, that might not be palatable to the people in the room, but that is nevertheless a number one acceptance of the idea that we should be using medicinal cannabis. Um, and that was decided within a small group of doctors in the ACT. You can understand, therefore, my confusion, um, where uh, this was published only uh, recently in the local hearings in uh, uh, state parliament that doctors were not convinced by a cannab cannabis plan. This is, in fact, um, a headline that derives from the AMA's position on medicinal cannabis. Um, and, of course, it's not true. It's misrepresenting the case that doctors are not convinced or doctors do not agree. But it was published on April Fool's Day, so, of course, they were just having a joke with me. Um, so it does beg the question, and you know, I would suggest to you that you, you think about who is opposing therapeutic or medicinal cannabis and for what reason. Um, I think there's several reasons. I think the one where we have to be kind and we have to be generous because there's an enormous body and wealth of information and knowledge within these sort of 200 meters of this building. And that knowledge has to be deployed like you would uh, teach maybe a slightly impaired child to ride a bicycle. Um, you guys need to teach politicians what is right and wrong about um, uh, medicinal cannabis. So there are p clearly people and doctors who have not read the literature, um, not gone to the literature, and are confused between the issues of medicinal and recreational cannabis. I think there are people who have a moral problem with drug use, and I think there are some doctors there, and that's, that's fine too. I won't give a blood transfusion to a person of a faith who doesn't believe that they should have a blood transfusion. That's, that's fine, I respect that. But neither do I assume that that person has any right 
to say that nobody else should have a blood transfusion. So if somebody doesn't want to have a cannabis-based product, that's cool, but they're not going to tell me who I can prescribe it to. But once again, I should be kind and courageous in the way that I deal with these people. The people I, I say have at it, the people I say go at and rip asunder, are the people who are involved with companies that are making opiates or other analgesics, the people who are in fact concerned about medicinal cannabis because it impairs their bottom line. And unfortunately, they are from within my ranks. So these people are some of the most outspoken opponents to therapeutic cannabis. And what's really interesting is if you have a quick look, and you can on the internet these days, it's a fabulous thing, the internet, to see who's actually funding them. And the manufacturers of opiate analgesia uh, are behind them, to the tune of billions of dollars. Um, and they have bought their say. I receive uh, no uh, endorsements by anybody at all, and I'm very careful about that. People provide me money to do my research because they like my research, but I'm not in anybody else's employ. And the other thing, of course, is that these pharmaceutical companies do not limit their donations to medicinal practitioners. They are also supporting people that you and I would have a difference of opinion with. So it's much more transparent in the United States as to where funding comes from. Very difficult in Australia to get to the bottom of that because there's shell company within shell company. But these people who they're giving millions of dollars to every year are not fond supporters of therapeutic cannabis. Another argument that is used is that the dosage can't be controlled. We've heard um, our colleagues uh, from the States uh, poo-poo that. And in fact, the Dutch have been very sensible about um, how they control dose. If you want to argue about whether the dose can or can't be controlled, you merely have to ask your opponent, well, is it possible to control the color of a tulip or a flower? And of course it is. Um, plant genetics and breeding does that very nicely. And it's exactly the same with the concentrations of THC and CBD. It's very easy to control. And the Office of, uh, cannabis, of Medicinal Cannabis in, um, in Holland does exactly that. Um, so to suggest that it's impossible or it can't be done is, is either ignorance and stupidity um, or it's a lie, either of which, um, in fact, precludes the person you're talking to from genuinely having a, an opinion or indeed having the right to talk to you about it. For, yes, of course. So. Um, Here's another example, Charlotte's Web, the strain from the United States, which I'm under the apprehension that some of my colleagues in, in the room might be acquiring shortly. Um, it's been reclassified as a hemp-based product. There is some debate about its efficacy, but once again, it's a fabulous example of the fact that a CBD-based strain can be produced and retailed. My parents told me never to use drugs. Well, does that include antibiotics? Have you ever had a nasty ear infection? Have you ever had codeine? What about morphine when you broke your leg? Uh, this is not a problem, you, the fact that you know, we're using a drug. The classification of drugs as an illicit is merely a, 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 a feature of history and tradition. Um, and cannabis in its current legal state is only in that space because of that history and tradition. Definitely not because of a proven uh, risk of harm. Before I finish up, here's a few extra things you might want to chuck into your argument. There's actually, there's people already using cannabis for medical purposes. It's already been, that, that, that horse is gone. And that, in fact, one thing that's really interesting is that it seems to be reducing the number of people in the United States where there is a cannabis program, reducing the deaths from opiates in those states. So this is of a public health benefit, a proven public health benefit in the United States. So what of research in Australia? There's no need to do any more research as far as compassionate use is concerned. That boat has sailed, you know, everything else is delaying. Um, or it's just ignorance. Um, and that is just a medical fact. Um, what about clinical trials? They're mired in controversy. I have good friends who are trying to get them off the ground in New South Wales. And there have been many public promises made by politicians. And behind closed doors, backflips, obscuring and obfuscation uh, which are in fact blocking uh, the emergence of these trials. And good scientists, people who I respect, are being asked to reinvent the wheel at great taxpayer dollar. 
this is, this is not the beast from the X-Men. This is Isaac Asimov, who said that no sensible decision can be made without taking account of not the world as it is, but what it will be. And so what we've done is we've thought about what the world in Australia will look like once and when therapeutic cannabis is legalized, because I believe it's inevitable. What practical infrastructure will be needed, which is the focus of our attention? So what we need is an idea of current practice and a way to tap into your expertise. Um, because if anybody knows anything about this in Australia, it's not the medical community. It's the people already doing this. We need an analytical program that can look at what is actually being consumed and match that to the clinical conditions. And we need an education program that will help inform clinicians about how to prescribe this and how they don't need to be afraid of it. And so we've set up this Australian Therapeutic Cannabis Observatory, a collaboration between the University of Canberra, the ANU, and my hospital, Calvary Hospital, a database to monitor current practice, which I'm hoping we can persuade you to participate in, a testing program, an analytical testing program to look at the various constituents of what people are actually putting into their bodies, and an education system, which we hope will result in one day a diploma uh, in therapeutic cannabis administration. And who, who the fuck is going to fund that? I know you might well ask. It probably won't be the NHNMRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council. It's not going to be the States or Commonwealth, and definitely not the Australian Medical Association. And this is kind of the sort of response that I get whenever I go looking for money uh, from anybody. Um, so we've decided to bypass that as well. So we have a project and a new funding model. And what would happen? What would we have to do to make sure that we didn't have to... Because I think funding is a way that people are controlling this research in Australia. And we, we have an idea, which I'd sort of float with you a lot. We have folks from the venture capital world who want to throw money at us because there is a budget here. Um, it is unconditional. They just want to see this happen in Australia. And it, it, these are six-figure sums. And we have people like yourselves who want to see this happening in Australia and who have dollars, single dollars, which I'll take in a Kickstarter way. And the combination of this, we believe, can generate millions in Australia with no requirement from anyone else, with no permission required from anyone else to determine how we conduct our research. And I think that this unholy union between the big end of town and the big end of Nimbin um, would allow us to do the research that actually needs to be done to ensure that there's a framework in place uh, when this legislation gets through at the end of the year. So we have our Australian Drug Observatory, which will include elements that are already present um, in, in research at the moment. And there are Australian Medical Cannabis Observatory, which will include elements of analysis, a database of consumers, all covered by medical confidentiality, it's medical, and education. Um, a forensic collaboration will fill out the rest. So in summary, I'm sorry to go a little over time, therapeutic cannabis is not recreational cannabis. It's not the same, nor should it be included in the same argument. I strongly disagree with those who say, let's not cede any ground, let's go hard for the whole hog, because it's too easy to resist. Little steps, ladies and gentlemen, little steps will get you where you want to be. The use, I believe, of medicinal cannabis in Australia is inevitable. There is no way that this will not happen. I actually think it's going to happen in terms of legislative framework this year. It's surprising, in fact, how much scientific support there is for this. And it opens the opportunity to create huge swathes of further research. Patience is paramount. And we all need to be kind and have courage. When we're talking about this to people, when we're representing, not just with it's easy here in Nimbin, but when we're back in normal land and we're talking to our friends in normal land, we need to be kind and have courage. Hybrid funding is going to bypass um, this traditional model and we should focus on the doable. I did have, I did have a movie, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to play it. Helen Kapalos has put together something amazing, um, but it doesn't really work here. But I would ask you to keep your eyes peeled. It's going to be shown in federal parliament um, as a premier. Um, and part of the, um, the income from that is going to fund our research. Um, so I would encourage you all to go see. Take your family and, and have a look. Um, um, 
I think it's, it's something like the end of life, but I think they're still working on a title. They've, she's just changed her production company. Um, but it'll be the only thing on medicinal cannabis. She's traveled all around the world, including to Israel, and uh, filmed some very interesting people. I'd be surprised if she hadn't pinged Wodak as well. Um, so there's be few people in the audience. Certainly the people that we saw, the mothers that we saw, are very prominent in this film. And I, like many of you, uh, I cry when I see this sort of thing. So, I would say uh, I'm at your disposal. Let me be a conduit in which I can fight a, a cause from a medical perspective. It is far too easy for my profession to dismiss your community in, and the knowledge that you have within. I, for one, am very respectful of the knowledge that you have, and I'm very keen to deploy it in any way that I can. And uh, let's keep talking and, and follow what we're doing. We'll be in touch. Thank you for your time. I've okay, folks, we do have a little bit of time for questions, but please wait for a mic before you start ans asking your question. I've completely encroached on young Behrman's talk, so I apologize, sir. Look, I, I agree with almost everything you've said. Hello? Yeah, I agree with everything you've said, uh, almost. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention to this poster, which has been put out for the Mardi Gras this year, uh, and it contains a long list of... Um, medical conditions that are helped by marijuana or cannabis. But it includes some that I'm sure you as a scientist would agree shouldn't be there, like loneliness, dysfunction, domestic abuse. Can you disabuse us all Look, about that? that's an excellent point, sir. And I think this is part of the problem with the great American experience that we're watching at the moment. Um, say, for example, in California, if you're a 16-year-old boy and you've sprained your ankle and you have the right words, you can score some weed um, on the basis of medical grounds alone. This is like any other uh, medicine, from my perspective, and I apologize you know, if, if there are you, those among you who regard it in the same way as you might regard alfalfa. There are active ingredients, that's why it works, and we need to be careful about that. Um, and I think there are clear conditions where it obviously works for. The debate is over. There is no need to conduct another trial. There are, for example, if we want to use marijuana for the treatment of loneliness, I think that's a perfect example of a trial that should be conducted. Um, by all means, conduct that trial. It's terrible to be lonely, but there are other things that can be used. It's where cannabis is the only thing that works where I think we should be, as a medical profession, quite compassionate about it. There is this bracket creep, and I do not for once think that this should ever be construed or misrepresented as the thin end of the wedge for global recreational consumption. Let's have that debate elsewhere. Let's keep those debates separately. I would not, if somebody were to tap me on the shoulder and say, you know that this is going to facilitate the introduction of recreational cannabis, I would find it very hard as a very honest person to disagree with them. But that's not my function here. My function is to ensure that a therapy that is proven to work and that is now available is widely available and more widely available to the people in, who need it, rather than making it more widely available in a, a factitious way to people who just want to smoke weed for fun. So I, I completely take your point. We do have to be careful to isolate the two. One is on the pathway to another. And I know, I mean, my biggest problem is that the people who desperately need this frequently don't have long to go. And that's where my haste is, is that there are people who are symptomatic from diseases that are killing them, and they have every right to have it now, and not in three years' time when a repeat trial that's been shown elsewhere is, is repeated in this country. Yeah, I'd like to ask hello. you a question. <laughs> I don't know where you are. Hello, hello. Yeah, yes. Hi. Firstly, I'd like to thank you and acknowledge you for the work that you do. Oof. I'm a practicing herbalist and I have been a herbalist working in Nimmin for over 30 years, so I very closely followed a lot of the arguments around um, legalization of cannabis, drug law reform, etc. Um, I, I heard you make that distinction between recreational and medicinal cannabis, yeah. and there are many of us who believe really that um, the debate around 
medicinal use of cannabis should actually rest with herbalists and people mm -hmm. who've been working with herbs for a long time. Yeah. And I just say to you, I actually have alfalfa in my dispensary. It's delicious. I, I love it. It's got nothing to do with it being delicious. Oh. It actually has medicinal properties. I no doubt that it does. That are very useful for health maintenance. What I would like to ask you is, in my 30 years of practice, I have lost many valuable tools of trade yeah. in my dispensary because of arguments put forward by doctors and by chemists. And why is it? that cannabis has attracted this level of attention at a medicinal level, and I do recognize its properties, but there are many other herbs that we've lost that have equal, equally valuable properties. What do we need to do as herbalists to bring those herbs back onto this debate platform? I, I could be polite and offer a number of suggestions. I'm more likely to, because it's me, to be pragmatic and say there's very little that you as herbalists can do about this. Um, unfortunately, um, it probably needs to come from the pharmaceutical and medical profession. There's no denying that there is a wealth of uh, information within the herbalist environment. Most of our modern medicine, uh, or the history of how we've evolved, certainly um, uh, medications, has come from a herbal pharmacopoeia. But to say that there is a, a route of engagement from the herbalist community to persuade um, uh, the APRA, for example. Um, I think if, say, for example, the herbalist community were to become registered with APRA and, and voluntarily be, allow themselves to be monitored in that way, that would not be palatable, I imagine, to many. Um, I actually don't, I'm not certain that there's a way forward, and, and I apologize for that. It is not a situation of my creation. It's a situation of modern medicine in the way it conducts itself. These, like I said, most doctors that I, I don't tend to socialize them. They have this position uh, whereby they are both the judge and jury of what is and isn't allowed. Do you, do you think, though, that it's because there has been such a strong push by recreational cannabis users? to create some sort of um, legalization of their drug of choice, that it, we've actually got to this point around medical cannabis. I mean, that, that's my feeling. Yeah, that's I, what I've observed in them. This is one of the reasons why we're trying to separate the two and, and distance the two. I have no moral objection whatsoever to people who want to uh, smoke cannabis recreationally. Myself, I, I don't like the effect that it has on me, but I've certainly used it. Um, but um, the idea that the two are equivalent and that it's, it's a two-for-one bargaining position is, is difficult. It's untenable, I think, with uh, the medical politics in this country at the moment. I guess the other thing is, is that in the last decade or so, there has been a lot of attention um, at the negative health impacts of recreational cannabis. Um, and it's, it's publicable. It's, uh, you know, I have never uh, treated anybody for alfalfa overdose, um, whereas I have treated many people for the side effects of overindulgence with cannabis. That could be a cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, they could be psychotic. And so there is a body of understanding, be it real or otherwise, within the medical community that cannabis is something that can cause harm. And, the, and, and part of the argument against um, uh, or, or to refute this uh, argument is that we're talking about two separate entities. The market has changed from the people who were here at the Aquarius Festival to the people who are here this year. The plant has changed. Um, and not, not for the benefit of mankind, I don't think. I think it's more a, a market-driven entity. Um, and that's your problem, is that we have to sort of retro-engineer the public relations campaign that has been mounted against... Um, all of cannabis. The people like myself will spend a lot of time distancing medical and recreational cannabis. The people who don't want medicinal cannabis will spend a lot of time bringing the two together and trying to make them indistinguishable. And I think the most important lesson that we have is that we should look at the tactics that our opponents are using and try to oppose those. So if they want to bring the two together, let's separate them. Hmm. Alex. David, uh, thank you for your talk, excellent talk. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the work you do. Uh, I share your uh, confidence that medicinal cannabis will start in Australia, that we're probably... Uh, Different timescale. 
Well, I, who cares when mm. it starts? The main thing is that it starts, and it starts sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but what interests me about that is thinking more towards a situation where medicinal cannabis is available and is used and is lawful. Um, Australia's got 23 million people. Mm. Two million of the 23 million will have used cannabis in the last year. Of the remaining 21 million, uh, a very high percentage uh, are very fearful about cannabis, and a lot of their fears are unrealistic. But yes. Nevertheless, they're very fearful about cannabis. So the question is, how can we, as doctors, encourage people who might benefit from can medicinal cannabis to use cannabis when they have when they're in an age group which is very resistant to it mm. and which considers any form of intoxication from cannabis, even in people with uh, severe nausea and vomiting following cancer chemotherapy or uh, other problems in advanced cancer. How can we help people to consider medicinal cannabis as a, as a medical option? This is part of our third arm. I mentioned the importance of educating doctors, and I think that's paramount. It's teach the teachers first. Um, and when we have a core group of practitioners who genuinely understand what we're talking about and who genuinely understand the potential benefits, albeit for perhaps a limited group of people, then what we can do is we can start putting together education. And you know, let's be frank about it, counter-education um, in the public domain about what people um, need to know. We need to be sentient as medical professionals that as and when we get out there and start talking about the potential benefits of cannabis, very, very powerful lobby groups will have at us. Um, and uh, by that I'm meaning big pharma. Big pharma do not want to hear this discussion, particularly from the mouths of doctors. And so we need to be prepared for that. We need to engage, unfortunately, in this modern era with social media. We need to think about um, our public relations campaign. We need to do all this. The, the era where merely what we say as doctors is law or is the word, um, that's gone. And we need to be very clever about how we sell this, not for financial benefit, but for ideological benefit to the general public. And, and that is a hard job. It sh shouldn't be assumed that that will be possible. So organization, collaboration, one of the things that I despair about most in Australia, unlike in the United States where people have managed to break down their own silos and pull together as a team to get much of this over the line, there are still too many fragmented groups in Australia that are kind of want to do this in their own way. Um, and if it's not done in their way, it's not going to get done. And we need to basically bring as many people as we can of like-minded uh, inclination and have them under the same banner. Maybe it's a banner that's to be based in, in Nimbin. I don't know. But it's something we need to talk about. Maybe while we're here this weekend. Okay, folks, I don't like to <laughs> stop it. No. We're, we're all here. So come and talk to us during the, the weekend. It'd be lovely to catch up. Thank you again. Uh, one more big hand for David. Thank you very much, David.